We've been looking at conformal mapping considering a series of three questions. The first question was, what is the requirement for a mapping to be one-to-one? -one? The second question was, what is the requirement for a mapping to be conformal? Turns out that they were the same. And then the third question is, what does Laplace's equation transform to? So if we transform from the z-plane to the w-plane, what happens to Laplace's equation? So we want to discuss that and answer that question in this video, and then we'll also do an example of conformal mapping. So what we're looking at is if you have a function, say, phi of x, y, that is harmonic, so it satisfies Laplace's equation in a domain d in, this, in the z-plane, what does that transform into in the w-plane, where we have the image domain capital omega under a conformal mapping f of z? Turns out the answer is very nice and quite unexpected, actually. So here's our Laplace's equation in Cartesian coordinates, partial squared phi, partial x squared, plus partial squared phi, partial y squared is equal to zero. There's really two ways to go about doing this. The typical way that you transform an equation from one domain into another, in general, is to use the transformation laws that we developed in a previous video earlier in this chapter. You remember we had transformation laws for partial partial x and partial partial y in order to transform from x, y to u, v coordinates. Now, for the second derivatives that we have here in Laplace's equation, for example, partial squared, partial x squared, that would be partial partial x of partial partial x. So we'd have that transformation law operating on itself. It gets very messy, it gets very tedious. If you want to look in the appendix, you can see how that's done. It takes about three pages in the appendix in text form in order to, to do that, to show the result. But again, that's the typical way that we transform a PD from one domain to another. Now because we're dealing with analytic functions in the context that we're discussing here, we can use a much more concise way. And that goes as follows. I can do this in two slides. So what we have, again, is that phi of xy is harmonic, satisfies Laplace's equation, and we have its harmonic conjugate psi of xy. So that forms a complex function, capital phi is little phi plus i psi, and this applies and is analytic in the domain D, in the z-plane. Now we have our mapping, w is f of z. We also have the inverse mapping, z is capital F of w, to go from the z to the w, w back to z-planes. So capital phi of z, where z is now capital F of w, the inverse mapping. So we have capital phi of capital F of w. We'll just call that a new function, capital phi hat of w. But the point here is that capital F of W is analytic. Okay, that's the mapping itself. It's analytic because it's conformal. And capital Phi is also analytic because the real part and imaginary part are harmonic conjugates of one another. So if you have an analytic function of an analytic function, that, as you would expect, is an analytic function as well. So capital Phi hat of W is indeed an analytic function. Because capital Phi hat is an analytic function, its real part and its imaginary part are also harmonic, also solutions of Laplace's equation. So if we equate the real parts, Phi and Phi hat are the same, and the imaginary parts, Psi and Psi hat are the same, we can see very easily that under conformal mapping, the solutions in both the Z and W planes are harmonic, and therefore satisfy Laplace's equation. So the main result is here. And again, this is beautiful and far more than what we could ever hope for. And that is when we have Laplace's equation in the z-plane and we transform it using a conformal map to the w-plane, it ends up being Laplace's equation again. So this is, this is tremendous. As I emphasize in the second point here, this is very unique. So normally when you have a complicated domain, and a relatively speaking simple equation in the z-plane, and you transform it to another domain, another plane, to make the domain easier, typically the equation becomes more complicated. So there's always that trade-off. But in this case, we take a complicated domain with Laplace's equation, we transform that into a simpler domain in the w-plane, and we're still only solving Laplace's equation. And again, it's all because of this beautiful property as a complex variable theory, analytic functions, and the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So we in fact say that Laplace's equation is invariant. In other words, it does not change when subject to a conformal map. All right, so let's take a look at an example. This will be a
fairly detailed example in order to illustrate how we can use conformal mapping to solve Laplace's equation in relatively speaking complex domains. This is what's known as a Dirichlet problem. A Dirichlet problem is governed by Laplace's equation with boundary conditions specifying the dependent variables around the boundary domain. Okay, so the shaded area here is the domain. It's bounded by two circles, a larger circle and a smaller circle. On the larger circle, the temperature is zero, and on the smaller circle, the temperature is one. So you'll notice I've couched this in terms of steady heat conduction, but that's completely immaterial to solving the problem. It could be an electrostatics problem, it could be a potential flow problem. It doesn't matter, we're just solving Laplace's equation. But we use the vocabulary of heat conduction in this particular problem. But again, it, we could couch it in terms of electrostatics equally well. So we want to solve Laplace's equation, here in, written in Cartesian coordinates, in our shaded domain between these two circles. So how can we do that? The first thing we need to think about is how we're going to transform our complicated domain in the z-plane into a simpler domain in the w-plane. In this case, you'll notice that our domain is bounded by circles. So that makes us think maybe a linear fractional transformation might be helpful here. Because remember, circles transform into circles or into lines under a linear fractional transformation. So in fact, we can simplify the domain significantly by using a linear fractional transformation to map that region between the circles into an infinite, this goes all the way up to infinity and down to negative infinity, an infinite vertical strip. We'll walk through the details of that in a moment and then we'll solve Laplace's equation. So this is the normal pattern, problem in the z-plane, can't solve it, so we come up with a mapping to the w-plane that simplifies it, solve it in the w-plane, and then map the solution back to the z-plane. That's exactly what we're going to do here. Okay, so let's talk about this mapping and see how it works. So you'll remember in um, our previous videos, we discussed how we can use this linear fractional transformation by picking three pairs of points. So a z1 and the image w1, z2, w2, z3, w3. And by carefully picking those three points in each domain, we can determine the fractional transformation that in, indeed that accomplishes the mapping that uh, we're interested in. So you'll notice I've actually labeled on here the three points. So here's Z1, here's Z2, and here's Z3. Z3 is at the origin where the two circles come together and it actually has zero thickness there. Okay, so Z1, Z2, Z3. The corresponding image points on the W plane, here's W1, W2, and, at, and W3 we're going to actually put at infinity. Remember we can put a point at infinity and infinity in the complex plane is, is everywhere at infinity. So this is infinity as well as this being infinity. Now the other two you'll notice that W1 that is that smaller circle. W2 is the larger circle where the temperatures are 1 and 0 respectively. And then by putting the third point at infinity that's going to make this, again, an uh, infinite vertical strip, as we discussed. All right, so here's those pairs of three points that we use. We substitute those into the equation 2.1. That's the expression that relates the w's and the z's together. And here's what we get for that. On the left-hand side, there's a factor in the numerator and one in the denominator that involves w3. So remember what we do. If one of our w's is infinite, which is the case for w3, that factor over the corresponding factor, that just becomes 1. So that's why we see only one factor in the numerator and denominator on the left-hand side. All right, so then we solve this for w. So you can just simply cross multiply here and solve this for w, which is 1 minus z over z. So in that way, we get our a is minus 1, our b is 1, our c is 1, and our d is 0 in the general fractional transformation. Now, all we've really confirmed is that these three triplets of points map to each other, or they're images of each other. So we have to be a little bit careful about the domain boundaries, and so we do need to check those. So to do that, let's check that the circle, this is the smaller inner circle, and this is the, the fancy complex variables way to write a circle. 
So this is a circle of radius a quarter centered at a quarter. And we want that to map to the vertical line u is equal to 1. And then similarly, we want our larger circle, which is centered at a half and radius a half, to map to the vertical line in the w plane u is equal to 0. So we can do that two ways. If you remember in a previous video, we did a mapping problem where we had to map the entire curve. And that's generally the case, because you need to look at the entire curve in the z-plane and map that entire curve to the w-plane. Here, we can do a little bit simpler approach, because we know that circles get mapped into other circles, or indeed lines, which is just an infinite radius circle. So because we know that behavior, all I have to do is pick three points. So if I pick three points, say, one, two, and three on the larger circle. I can just map those three points, find their images in the w plane, and confirm that indeed they are on the u is equal to zero vertical line. Same thing here, I can pick three points on the smaller circle and do the same thing, because I know that I'm gonna get a line or a circle. I don't have to map the entire curve. Remember, why three points? It's because any three points, if they're collinear, they define a line. If they're not collinear, then they uniquely define a circle. So I won't go through the details of that, but that is something we need to be careful and, and check to confirm that indeed that is the case. So now we're ready to solve Laplace's equation in the w plane. So let's write it down. The dependent variable now is t hat, so it's the, the temperature in the w plane. Remember the values of t and t hat are the same, it's just that the points have been moved around. So if it's 15 degrees in the z plane at a point, it's 15 degrees at the corresponding image point in the w plane. And then our independent variables are u and v. So we've written Laplace's equation in the w plane. Now just to remind ourselves what the boundary conditions are, t hat is equal to zero along u is equal to zero, that's the left boundary, and t hat is equal to one along u is equal to one, that's the right boundary. Okay, so now we need to think about how we're gonna solve Laplace's equation in an infinite vertical strip. So let's go back to our schematic here. So you'll notice first of all that it's the same width. From positive infinity, negative infinity, it always has everywhere a width of one. So it's constant width along the vertical strip. Likewise, you'll notice that the boundary conditions are the same. So it's t is equal to zero along this entire infinitely long left boundary, and t hat is equal to one along the right vertical boundary. Now why do I say all that? Because imagine standing here and looking across to the other side. What do I see? Well, where I'm standing, the temperature is zero, and I go one unit across to the right boundary where the temperature is one. If I do the same thing at another point, I see the same thing. Another point, exactly the same thing. So what I'm getting at is, in fact, this is a one-dimensional problem. The temperature varies with u, across the width of the infinite strip, but it does not vary with v. So as I move up and down, I will have the same distribution across horizontally from left to right. So that's the argument for why this is actually only a one-dimensional problem. So t hat, instead of being a function of u and v, is actually only a function of u. Well, how does that help us? Well, if t hat doesn't change with v, then this term vanishes, and I simply have partial square t hat partial u squared is equal to zero. In fact, because t hat is only a function of u, it now becomes an ordinary derivative. So we have d squared t hat du squared is equal to zero. Well, that's about the easiest differential equation to solve that we can imagine. Just integrate twice, and you get a straight line, a u plus b. So we have a linear temperature profile across the width of our infinite vertical strip. Put in the boundary conditions, and you get A is one, and B is zero. Now you notice when I did this mapping, I did a couple things. First of all, I took this point, stretched it to infinity, took this point, stretched it to negative infinity, so that gave us our infinite vertical strip and I also reflected it. And the reason why I did that was put, to put the boundary with the zero temperature on the left and the boundary with the 
temperature of 1 on the right. Did I have to do that? No, not necessary at all. But because I did that, when I solve my differential equation, I get the straight line. Now t hat is simply u. It goes from 0 at u is equal to 0 to 1 at u is equal to 1. So as you can see, then getting the solution in the w plane in this particular case is very, very straightforward. And always look for situations where the solution is 1D. It's not always 1D. If it's not, we'll have to use a different approach. But in the cases where you can convince yourself that it really is one dimensional, then it simplifies the problem tremendously. It actually converted our PDE into an ODE. Now I'm going to emphasize that t hat here could be, in general, a function of u and v. But in fact, it's just equal to u. OK, so now we need to transform the solution that we just obtained in the w-plane back to the z-plane, back to the original z-plane in terms of x and y. So to do that, we need our, our, the u and the v, the real part and imaginary part, of our mapping. So our mapping was 1 minus z over z. And I'm going to substitute in for z x plus i y. You can do x plus i y, r e to the i theta. I did x plus i y. And I separate out the real and imaginary parts. Got to get rid of this i down here. So you multiply this by complex conjugate of z, as well as the, the numerator. And when you get the real parts and imaginary parts, this is what you get, real and imaginary. And then I just simplify this real part just a little bit. It, it's really not very important. OK, now I actually only needed u because our t hat is only a function of u. But we get both u and v. And in general, then, we would substitute these back into our solution for t hat. In this case, t hat is just u. So t hat is simply x over x squared plus y squared minus 1. And remember, t hat is the same as t, just again at the corresponding image points. So t of xy is equal to t hat of uv, and that's equal to this expression, in this case, simply u. So that's the solution. Now what does it look like if you plot lines of constant t? So these are isotherms. This is what it looks like. Remember, on the outer boundary, it's temperature of 0. On the inner boundary, it's a temperature of 1. And I'm showing isotherms of, at every point 1. So this is 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 3, 4, 5, 0.9, and then 1. I want to emphasize that these mappings are not unique. So for this particular problem, you can easily imagine other possible mappings. So here's, here's one. So I could maybe map it into a donut shape, an annular shape, like this. Because it's already circles, right? So maybe I could map it into something that looks like that and solve it there. And that will work just as well. So these mappings are not unique. And of course, this makes it confusing when you're doing problems and taking exams. But in general, this is good because it gives us the flexibility to consider and try different mappings that might work for a particular problem. So again, they're not unique. One may be easier than another in order to solve Laplace's equation in that domain in the W plane. But in fact, uh, when you map it back to the Z plane, you'll get the same solution.